Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 11 Tribulation The moon was full later that night as it wrapped the town below in an iridescent shine that placed the empty community of Codessa in a brief state of tranquility. The modest municipality sat within minutes just northeast of Walta Larga the destination sought after by the three desperados and their captive tour guide. They decided to barricade themselves in a small vacant home, tucked away in a small neighborhood, which was overgrown with the invasive jungle vegetation surrounding the vacant town, which laid in ruins. They chose this particular home as it was one of the few that had a mostly intact garage in which they could partially hide their commandeered vehicle. Like before, they decided to take shifts sleeping to gather the essential rest they required for the imminent tasks before them. The house was an antique at best. The exterior walls, once perhaps a vibrant yellow, was now barely discernible as any true color at all. Most of its dull golden hue had simply vanished from the many years of neglect prior to the team's claim upon it as a temporary base camp and its white trim, hardly identifiable as the raw wood underneath it, began taking over. The inside of the home was not in any better shape, as it had clearly been ransacked several times throughout the past for supplies. Darkened by the night, the only light in their temporary shelter was brought in by the rays from the moon above. The carpet, what little was left, was shredded up and down and was rolled off to various sides exposing its bare concrete ground. This one level, tiny home was mostly comprised of white interior walls, which over time had rotted through, leaving large holes within them, exposing old electrical wires and aluminum ducting. The baseboards of these walls, now home to small critters, were interrupted of its typical activities, while only a few large rats dotted along their perimeters. A few feet away, Beck lay with her eyes shut, 
as her rhythmic breathing was the only thing that could be heard within the confines of the domicile's living room. It was her turn to sleep. Trevor was keeping guard, watching through the windows, while Seth dutifully minded their hostage, Eduardo. Beck slowly started to come out of her sleep as her little brother whispered at her side. Beck, time to go. Let's go get those kids. Her eyes slowly opened as she could see Trevor kneeling over her, clutching his gun by his side. As she gained her bearings, she noticed Seth and Eduardo standing behind him, Eduardo's hands behind his back, with Seth firmly clasping them together with one hand and his gun in the other. Just like we planned, Trevor continued as he looked at Eduardo, then back to Beck. He's gonna drive us in and take us right to Santiago. Beck closed her eyes slowly and shook her head, acknowledging her brother and signaling her readiness. As she gathered herself up in preparation for departure, Seth began going over the plan with their hostage, ensuring the group of his cooperation. You wanna get out of this? Do everything we talked about. Remember, we have nothing to lose. We're not leaving without them. I'll be sitting just behind you. And this, he said as he peered over at his weapon, this will be right behind you as well. I get the slightest sense you're up to anything funny. I pull the trigger. They might kill us, but not before you have a cold sensation running through your paralyzed body. From all the nice new hardware I just put into your fucking spine. Get it? Eduardo responded with a half-frightened look. He was not used to dealing with such prepared escapees. Yes, I understand, friend. Trust me. If you appear as my prisoners, they will not suspect a thing. The three then carefully checked the window and made their way through the door leading to the attached garage. A couple of them turned on their flashlights as the four made their way to their prospective seating arrangements, while Trevor took a moment to remove some debris they had used to shield the vehicle from view, as the door to this meager carport had long been missing in action. Eduardo was now at the driver's seat with Seth sitting behind him, just like he had promised his prisoner, and Beck was in the passenger seat with her brother now sitting behind her. Don't fuck us over, Eduardo. Beck added as Eduardo began to make his way down the short cracked cement driveway. Beck and Trevor both had their guns under their feet, while Seth had his between his legs, pointed at the back of the driver's seat with a dark, dirty blanket they had found in the home wrapped around it. Eduardo turned his lights on as they made their way up the vacant neighborhood road, eventually disappearing around a corner. Once we pass through the gates of Santiago's pasture, I will take you to his home. Eduardo announced to his passengers. When we come up to it, we will know he's there once we see his horse. Back looked over at him. His what? Eduardo nodded and continued. Yes, Santiago insists all of his men use horses. Easier to maintain the residence and easier to maneuver between buildings when pursuing anyone attempting an escape. His horse will be easy to identify. Beck looked over again, waiting for him to explain why this was, but he didn't proceed with his comment, so Trevor, clearly seeing Beck's look of confusion match his own, decided to push him on the subject. Why is that? Eduardo looked up in his review mirror. Because he is the only one with a white horse, my friend. The chatter within the vehicle came to a lull as Eduardo kept his eyes on where he was going and the other three made notice of landmarks along the way. It was dark everywhere they looked, just the moonlight dimly illuminating their changing environments. The buildings, from what they could see, were just a mix of small stores and homes. A few parking lots and fields created voids in their surveillance of the moonlit city as their car shook from the tattered roads they traversed. Then the driver finally broke the silence. There it is. The three trained their sights in front of them on the darkened road that now lay before them. About 900 feet or so ahead was a dark void with lit torches along it, appearing to be some kind of fence. The road led to an opening within the barricade 
with a few men on horses guarding the entrance. Beck, Trevor, and Seth all put their hands behind their backs, pretending to be cuffed. Seth, still gripping his gun, prepared to reverse his position and fire should Eduardo betray them. And now, the only sound in the car was the sounds of their increasingly pounding hearts. If they could just get Santiago as their newest hostage, Delilah and Caleb would be handed over to them and they could be rid of this nightmare and on their way. And none of them saw a problem with this, as the advantage of surprise they used on the Chancellor was now, once again, on their side. As the vehicle approached the torch-lit entrance within the walls, they immediately gained the attention of the three armed horsemen. Trevor noticed a dark, familiar presence, just off into the shadows to the sides of the guards. He couldn't quite make out any shapes, but he knew someone or something was there. He had flashes of a disturbing dream he once recently had, that he was still yet to fully recollect. This, however, was quickly ushered from his mind as Eduardo slowed the vehicle to a complete stop. Two guards on horseback now approached their vehicle on either side, peering down into the truck. Eduardo, one of the Hispanic horse riders, called out in his native accent, greeting the driver. Eduardo responded in kind, Carlos, Senor, que pasa? The guard, now at the driver's side door, leaned over his horse and lowered his voice. Friend, visiting hours are no more. What is this? Eduardo, prepared for the question, quickly and confidently replied. Gifts from the Chancellor. Gifts for Santiago. The horseman hesitated, looked at the three passengers appearing to be cuffed, then locked eyes with Beck and immediately smiled. Then he looked back at Eduardo and nodded. He looked over to the one horseman left at the entrance, nodded once more, and with that, a path became clear for the vehicle as Eduardo slowly entered Santiago's prison compound. Beck kept a look in her side mirror through the corner of her eyes as she saw something unsettling begin to unfold and whispered under her breath, hardly moving her lips. Why are they following us? Eduardo checked his rearview mirror and suggested a few theories. Just watching us make our way, they should turn back soon. They don't ever wander too far from their post. The area they now found themselves in was dimly lit by torches. It was an old rundown neighborhood with battered homes, boarded up windows, and overgrown vegetation spreading along the sidewalks. It was a sight not unfamiliar to the three. The actual road they were on was just loose gravel with spotty areas of pavement resembling the road that once was there. Seth then spoke up. What the fuck is this? The four then fixed their eyes on the development that was now slowly unfolding ahead of them. From a darkened alleyway ahead, behind a two-story home, emerged a man on horseback. He crossed the torch-lit road in front of them about 200 feet or so, turned towards them, and stopped, forcing the truck to slow. Then. Several horsemen followed behind him as they fell into the same pattern, forming a line of nine or ten horses in front of the approaching vehicle. Eduardo came to a slow rolling stop. What the fuck? You said they wouldn't suspect anything. Seth remarked from the back seat, removing his hands from behind his back and nudging his hostage forcefully with it through the back of the driver's seat. Eduardo, Seeming to be caught off guard by the growing dilemma, tried reasoning with his captors, stammering his words about. I, I'm sure it is just precautionary, yes. Just act normal. Suddenly, all the men on the horses now before them pulled out handheld guns and aimed them at the vehicle. One of them pulled out a loudspeaker and began making an announcement in a thick Hispanic accent lacking a full grasp on the English words as he spoke. Everyone out of automobile. No guns, or we shoot the children. The words made Beck shudder as the images in front of her began to bear fruit to their aggressor's short monologue. The horses slightly parted, and through the open middle came a white horse. It was Santiago. He was wearing black jeans, 
in a white dress shirt and had several gold chains around his neck. As he smiled at the vehicle, everything seemed to happen in slow motion. He turned his horse to the side, giving his caught-off guard adversaries a better view, and there behind him, upon the saddle, sat Caleb and Delilah, both of them scared, shaking and blindfolded. Beck started breathing heavily in fear for her children's lives. No, she cried in a hushed tone. A man behind Santiago dismounted his horse and approached the two kids. He gathered them up and placed them standing on the ground. Though they could not see anything going on, they each held a frightened face, petrified of what was taking place around them. Get out of the car, Eduardo. We're not leaving without them. It's you for them, Seth announced, depicting an intended trade. With that, the four of them began to exit the vehicle. Trevor and Beck made their way out with their hands high in the air. Seth followed Eduardo out, carrying his gun. Once a few steps in front of the Jeep, Seth began to attempt a negotiation, yelling to the small army across from them while aiming his gun at his hostage. It doesn't have to be like this. We've got something of yours. You've got something of ours. Let's make a deal. You'll never see us again. Santiago looked at his men around him, then looked back at Seth and chuckled. He then looked at Eduardo and praised him. Eduardo, you are a good man. Everything went as you and I had planned. Your task is complete. Thank you for your services. Beck and Trevor looked at each other, both coming to the same conclusion. It was a trap. It was a trap, and they walked directly into it. Then, as the realization of this plot washed over their faces, they each flinched and slightly ducked at the sound of a gun going off. Then, to Seth's astonishment, Eduardo fell to the ground, a bullet in his head, rendering his side of any deal null and void. The three looked over at Eduardo in horror, now laying on the asphalt, convulsing in his own last death throes. A man behind Santiago, on one of the horses, cocked his still smoking pistol and gave a nod to his boss. Santiago looked at him, then back to Seth. I don't make deals with cattle. Now, put gun on ground. Seth looked lost. He couldn't believe the ruthlessness of it all as he froze, failing to heed Santiago's warning. With that, Santiago pulled a gun of his own from his back and aimed it at the kids and fired. Beck fell to her knees, crying. No, as she looked up, she noticed it was just a warning shot at their feet. Both of the kids were now terrified, in tears and crying aloud and calling for their aunt Beck to rescue them. Seth, Beck cried, trying to snap her friend out of his daze. Seth looked over while coming out of his shocked stupor and immediately placed the gun on the ground. As he did so, the man that once stood near the kids walked up and grabbed the gun off the ground. Then he looked at Seth, meeting him eye to eye as Santiago spoke up once more. Joseph was a good man, he shouted, reminding the three about Joseph's fate while in their possession. He worked for me for many years before Paco recruited him. He was like a son to me. You poisoned him, turned him on us. It is time you learn how the Beltran Leva deal with enemies like you. Now you find out how I deal with enemies like you. The way my great grandfather, Arturo Leva, dealt with his enemies. Santiago then gave the three a menacing glare as the two children were promptly placed back upon his horse. He slowly disappeared through his men and receded into the darkness while his young hostages' cries grew faint. Seth looked at the man in front of him and without warning was met face to face with the butt of the gun he had just placed on the ground earlier. An excruciating blow to the head forced him to the ground his surroundings immediately darkening as he passed out. He could hear the screaming and shouting of Beck, Trevor, and the children echo within his mind, mixed with a loud ringing in his ears from the blunt force trauma to his skull. 
indiscernible conversations took place as all the noises faded out slowly to a deafening silence. He could see his dad's face within the darkened recesses of his mind. Eventually, his father's entire body began to take form as a very familiar playground behind him took shape. His father kept getting closer and closer as he felt a sensation of pure enjoyment envelop him. Thomas grabbed onto the chains on either side of Seth and pulled him toward him and then pushed him once again, high up in the air on the playground swing set. They were both laughing hysterically. Suddenly, Seth was at a picnic table with his parents. He could remember every detail of his seventh birthday party as he blew out his candles. His mom and dad cheered for their boy, now one year older. It was one of his fondest memories when his parents were still together. We will always love you, Seth, his father told him as his mom took her cue to add on. We are so proud of you. Then, suddenly, out of place and not part of his memory, his parents vanished from view as the skies went black as a storm began to grip the setting in a darkening gloom. The picnic table was now gone, and the heavens grew more intense as a downpour struck him with an unrealistic pounding of rainfall. He then woke up lying in the mud face down. He looked up right in time to see another bucket of water drench his face and body. It was unsettling only being able to feel around him, unable to see anything as the water splashed across his entire line of sight. Finally, as the water was swept away by gravity, he wiped his eyes as his surroundings began to take place. It was still dark and had not been too long since he went unconscious. He quickly realized they hadn't moved since being caught. He was lying face down on the road they were recently driving on with Eduardo. A two-story home blocked a small alleyway to his right. He could see, across a small patch of dirt and mud, Trevor and Beck both sitting and bound together. They were back to back, their heads turned toward him, each of them gagged, looking on in horror. He felt his feet tied together, but his hands were loose. He tried to gather himself up by leaning on his forearms, but was met with a violent knee to his spine, forcing him back to the ground. The man then knelt over and began to talk to Seth in a whisper. It was Santiago. My brother is how you say, faint of heart. I mean, sure, he can kill a man, but he always makes it too quick. I guess management can do that to you. Soften you up, eh? Me, I like to take my time, he said, as he used a gun as an extension of his arm and signaled to Beck and Trevor. I also like to have an audience. With that, he took his knee from Seth's back and changed position to stand in between him and his horrified friends. He could see Beck was crying, and Trevor was trying to shout his repudiations through his gag. He then heard the unnerving sounds of an engine being started up. Trevor and Beck's eyes grew in sheer horror as they were now both trying to scream their pleas through their gags. To understand the threat that his friends were seeing, Seth flipped to his back to find himself tied by chains, attached to a running vehicle. Trevor was trying to say something, anything to make Santiago reconsider. If only he could switch places with his friend, he would tell Santiago exactly that, he thought to himself. He could feel the fear sweep through his best friend as Seth realized what was about to take place his eyes growing with utter fear and confusion. Santiago looked back at Beck and Trevor and smiled. Then he looked back at Seth, who was trying to get his ankles loose from the metal chain. He just laughed as he said his goodbyes to Seth. Adios, muchacho. Trevor and Beck, now both letting out muffled screams and crying, closed their eyes and grimaced to the sound of Seth's painful shrieks as his body was pummeled across the jagged terrain slowly fading into the dark distance. And just like that, Seth was gone. Only the sound of the roaring engine muffling his screams fading away. Santiago turned and walked up to them, kneeling by their sides 
as they shed tears for their friend's slow, painful death actively taking place in the distance. So, what was the plan? You come in as Eduardo's prisoners, and he takes you to me, eh? You use me as a hostage to get your kids back? You know, for a moment, you guys really had me and my brothers worried. Honestly, I didn't think my plan was going to work. But you cattle, you are so tied to your loved ones, not willing to just let go. He continued speaking over their muted anguish. Didn't it seem all too easy? Your ticket into my town, just sitting there on a hill, sleeping, waiting to be taken. Once my brother figured out it was you who killed Kent and his men, I knew you'd want your kids back. So now you can have them back. Santiago snapped his fingers. Beck and Trevor watched as the back door of a nearby truck opened the two kids being escorted out of it. Not blindfolded anymore, they saw Beck and Trevor and ran up to them. They embraced the pair on their knees, crying out their names. Trevor and Beck, bound at the wrists, were unable to embrace them back, but felt comforted by the short reunion nonetheless. Then, suddenly, two men grabbed them and drugged them away as Beck yelled through her gag, crying and pleading with Santiago and his deranged men. They could not see what the men were doing, however, as they were turned away from their view. Finally, the men parted, and Caleb and Delilah came into focus, each of them wearing a noose around their heads. Santiago looked at Beck and leaned into her. Now you get to watch them die. Beck looked at him, only able to make out bits and pieces of his face as her tears became too much to see through. Suddenly, to her complete and utter shock, the face she was looking at, the face of this gangster they call Muerte, was ripped from its bones as blood went everywhere. Gunfire began rapidly taking place. The jungle momentarily lit up in a fiery blaze of several machine guns dispatching their ammunition across the cartel congregation. Santiago's detached jaw fell from its bone structure onto her lap as he collapsed to her side. She closed her eyes and grinded her teeth around her gag, waiting for a bullet to do the same to her as the once, somewhat quiet field around them quickly turned into a war zone. The gunfire kept going for several minutes as she heard several men yelling in Spanish. She could hear the sounds of horses and the ground tremble from their flurry. She could feel her brother up against her back, shuddering as well, neither of them understanding the evolving drama around them. Slightly behind her, she could hear and feel a horse take an unfortunate fall as it came crashing to the ground. Slowly the gunfire came to a stop as Trevor and Beck looked up. The kids, now free from their captor, still with nooses around their necks, once again ran up to them. They sat there, bound, not understanding the gravity of what had just happened, and took in their surroundings while Delilah and Caleb embraced them. The small neighborhood dirt road around them was now filled with several dead cartel soldiers. A few horses had met their demise as well. One of them, its lifeless carcass atop a deceased man still clutching a pistol. Throughout the dirt road and small fields around it, Bodies and entrails dotted the surface, blood glimmering under the dancing lights from nearby torches. Along the ground, small red dots from distant sniper weaponry darted from this way to that. Suddenly, from the shadowy distances on either side of them, military soldiers, all in dark fatigues, ran out of the darkness up to the survivors. All of them were moving with stealth, not speaking, wearing night vision masks, aiming their weapons at Trevor, Beck, and the panicked children. Eventually, they were surrounded by dark military figures standing around them while others secured the perimeter as one of them knelt beside the four startled survivors. Trevor immediately identified the patch on the shoulder of the officer kneeling in front of them. It was an American flag. A small sensation of relief flushed through his body. The soldier then removed her mask. 
She was carrying a small toolbox with a familiar red medical symbol on it and placed it at her side. She looked at the four and pulled a scanner from her kit. While she scanned Delilah, she began giving directions to her fellow officers. This one's clean, she said as another officer grabbed Delilah and separated her from the other three. She continued to scan the group as Trevor and Beck's confusion only kept growing. Clean, clean, clean. With that, a few more officers began freeing Trevor and Beck from their bounds. The officer with her mask off looked at Trevor and Beck as they rose to their feet. The kids ran to Beck and grabbed her by her hands and hid behind her. Trevor stood close to his three family members, confused and looking to the officer for some answers of what was going on. The unmasked soldier looked at the two hiding kids, then to Beck and Trevor and began speaking, while her fellow officers watched the dark distances for any signs of approaching cartel. You guys are clean. No parasite detected. Consider yourselves lucky. The water they provide the prisoners here contain a parasite, a microscopic worm that eventually makes its way to the brain. The human body repels it for a while, but after weeks or even months of relentless, watery intrusions, they begin to break through the body's defenses. Then, slowly, it takes over essential parts of your minds, rendering the person infected nearly catatonic. The two then thought of how everyone in the Chancellor's possession acted like they were in a trance-like state. Beck thought of the people within the cages of Pakos Yat, and Trevor thought of the ones that were just standing and looking on with no appearance of any emotions as his late friend Eugene lost his life at the hands of two Russian soldiers. She then carried on with her warning. It makes them more obedient. But it also forces dormant traces of the virus that caused the pandemic years ago to resurface. Only this time, it's much more contagious, spreading quickly with the parasite along for the ride. So, if you come in contact with any water from these villages, do not drink it. Stick to boiling your water from rivers and streams. Now, this region is to be decontaminated by 0900. We're not in the business of rescuing the healthy. So, I suggest you move out before we finish our mission here. Trevor and Beck looked at each other, and then back at the speaking officer with more confusion. Finish? he asked, wondering what would become of all the cartel's innocent hostages. The Marine looked at him, and as if to speed up the unnecessary meeting taking place, without answering Trevor's question, reluctantly responded. There's a city about nine hours south of here, she said as she pulled out a map and handed it to Beck. Ponta Blanca. We can't help you get there. We still have a lot of work to do with these cartel camps. But if you make it there in two days, three sunrises from now, a United States military aircraft is going to be vacating healthy survivors. The vessel's name is Salvation. Beck looked at the female officer with a confused expression. Just like that, we're on our own. We have two small children, and most of our group have already been killed by these gangsters. There's no way we can make it. The officer rolled her eyes as if wishing to hurry this conversation to its end. Listen, lady, we have three things on our agenda we have to accomplish before salvation lands in two days. One, eliminate the Russian threat. Two, eliminate the cartel threat. And three, neutralize the parasitic virus. Now I'm not sure if you noticed but rescuing survivors is not in our scope of tasks. We don't have room for recruits, let alone survivors. It's strictly against orders. Beck's face fell in despair as she slowly realized their nightmare wasn't close to over. The impatient Marine looked at Beck and made a half attempt to console her. Look, the cartels and Russians have their hands full with us now. Besides us, 
There is only one target they're after. Some renegade outfit, I guess. Anyway, find a vehicle with plenty of gas and make it there. Stay off the highway. You're likely to be caught, she said as she gestured to the map Beck now held. Evacuation teams are taking everyone to an undisclosed location. A sanctuary. A hope for survival. Trevor looked over at the map Beck held and then regained his focus on the soldier. What's the one other target? You know, besides you, Trevor questioned as the female officer put her mask back over her face and her team readied themselves for departure. Geared back up with her mask on and a medical kit and gun at her side, she let out a hushed sigh and answered Trevor. I don't really know. Our intelligence has come back with bits of information, but not much. They appear to be hell-bent on making amends with a leader of some group that infiltrated their town of Esmeralda. Apparently, this group dispatched one of their head trackers and a few of his men. Hung them from trees. Trevor and Beck's eyes widened. She kept speaking as her and her team began leaving the area, speedily moving on to their next objective. As they moved further away, the volume of her voice raised slightly, as to be heard from a growing distance. We haven't made our way to Esmeralda yet, so we're not exactly certain. But we do know the cartel leader was the infamous Lazar, goes by the Chancellor, now though. Used to have him locked up in Colorado. According to our sources on the ground, him and a few of his men are personally seeking this revenge. If you come across this group, stay clear of them. They have a death wish. It's not good to be on this gangster's mind. They're seeking the group's leader himself. Then finally, as the Marines began disappearing into the darkness, she shouted the final few words of her lengthy but hurried answer. I believe his name is Trevor Meeks.